When we made an, internet, an Amazon trash can that automatically restocks what you throw out, it was basically taping an internet-connected camera to the inside lid of your trash can. So this camera is becoming the Uber sensor of the Internet of Things. Now today, we will all take photos and share them online, right? Like how many people have done so already? <laughs> Sort of crazy, even at nine o'clock in the morning. So we're like photo sharing, this volitionally taking pictures has just become a part of how we spend our time. But what's changing is that photos, that the, the cameras that are in our phones are leaping out of the phones and getting atomized into nearly everything. And photography is changing from being something that you intentionally do to something that's being incidentally done for you. And this is going to have a big change in terms of how we think about photography and how we think about retail. So we're taping cameras everywhere in our lives. You notice this as you walk around. In our retail stores, in our homes, in our offices, our TVs all have cameras. Billboards are measuring viewership. Tolkien imagined trees that could see. I just put up hunting cameras for my dad so we could see pictures like this in the middle of the night. Our pens have cameras in the end. Has anybody had an Enoto pen? No? This is a, a pen that has a camera in its tip and a microphone. So it time stamps all, and records all of your gestures. And you get back to what you want to know by tapping on your notes right there. And it replays the conversation from there forward. So just think about these, these cameras are getting atomized. One of my students just made this brush. And the brush is able to sample the world with a camera so that you could then make, make marks or gestures based on the things that you sample about the world. Isn't that nice? There's another startup out of the Media Lab that's putting cameras in light bulbs. So light bulbs become Pico projectors with cameras embedded so that they can see what's in front of them. There's a startup in, pa in Palo Alto called Memo Me for the memory mirror that has, puts a camera behind a mirror so you can see the, the fairest outfit of them all or your ass. An important aspect of any magic mirror is to be able to see your, your ass. Um, <laughs> our, <laughs> these cameras are being stuck into the next version of selfie sticks, otherwise known as drones. Balls that you can throw, that a SWAT team can throw in to an unknown place and stitch a panorama in real time so they can see what's happening. Ovens can take selfies so they don't burn your cookies. Plates can scan. This is a plate that just got kickstarted funded on Kickstarter that has microgram scales and three cameras that are doing computer vision on your food to figure out what the hell you're eating. Uh, LG, uh, LG and Samsung are putting cameras inside of fridges to stop selling steel boxes and start to get into Amazon's business, or at least talk to Amazon's API. We're putting cameras in pills. We're putting cameras in full spectrum cameras and baby monitors. We're putting them on our bikes and cars. We're putting them in our, we're sewing them into our uniforms. Um, I've been wearing one this morning just to freak you out. Uh, this is a, a, a camera by a Swedish company called Narrative that takes a photo of you every 30 seconds with a GPS. Um, and it makes a little flip book of your day. So this is what I've been up to. You know, this is one day in Cambridge, another day in Copenhagen where I teach uh, a class with a magician from London on enchanted things. So you can, you know, this is the, the quantified self Uber sensor, right? This is so much better than Fitbit. It reveals, are you spending time indoors or outdoors? Also, what are you fixating on? Like, what are you shopping for? How, much, how often are you snacking? Like, all of these things are revealed through these wearable cameras. So that's what's happening. And here's what I think it means. What it means is that all these photos that people are sharing on Instagram and Twitter and Tumblr, 1.8 billion every single day, you need an image recognition system to make sense of all this stuff, right? Tim from Watson over there is thinking, this is great. This is like another unstructured form of big data. What could we do with this? Um, I've been working on a company out of the Media Lab to work on deep learning networks to make sense of all of this stuff, to read every photo on social. And I think it means important things for retail. So all of these photos can be classified, can be labeled for all of the brands and all of the objects and all of the things inside the photos if you use deep learning networks. 
If you want to see a demo of what's being shared on social right now, you can go to de uh, Stream Ditto in order to see like what ice cream brands, what alcohol brands are being used, what clothing brands are being viewed right now. But what's interesting is it's not just brands. It's also being able to label the rest of the world. You can see who drives a truck in Tennessee, who's, who just bought a new boat that needs insuring. Um, what's the most alluring photo? So you can train deep learning networks sort of, it's, it's uncanny, all the way, almost the way that you'd have intuitions about the world. If you can get a training set of data, of fashion data, of alluring data, of exciting data, the deep learning network can learn what alluring is and what exciting is and what sexy is and can do almost like what an art director does. So you can find the most exciting part of your GoPro videos, the most alluring, memorable beach shots or shots of Dubai. Um, the, har the, the people who aren't wearing hard hats at um, construction sites, uh, the most alluring um, match.com photo. So all of these things can be trained with deep learning networks. This is probably the most interesting thing going on in computer science today. So what are brands doing with all this data? It's really three things. One is they're, they're asking the question, who's using my product and where? And they're also measuring my viewership on social media versus my peers. And then you can also find who are the people that are doing this behavior. Make sense? I think that all of these photos, the photos that are dominating all of our, all of our attention on social media, once labeled, will really change how we shop. Because user-generated content has monopolized how kids spend time today. So, all of, so computer vision, CV, structures all this unstructured data and allows us to make links on photos just like we make links on, on uh, text today with, with hyperlinks, right? So it allows our photos to become hyperlinkable. So we'll be able to look at a photo and say, learn more about that, go to that place, call that person, watch that game highlight, connect with that guy, donate to that cause, shop similar things directly from photos. That's the ramification. So examples are Warby Parker wants you to shop your friend's new glasses. SeatGeek wants you to schedule a game, game wants you to schedule a, a, a seat at that ball game. eBay wants you to shop your friend's stand-up paddleboard photos. Expedia would love for you to book a, a, a trip to that beach. Open table for dining. Hotel tonight for hospitality. You get the idea. You want to listen to the t-shirt. You want to preview the movie poster. You want to shop those crazy pants. You want to borrow that car on a sharing economy site like, like Turo or Relay Rides. Does that make sense? Right, so all of these photos will become hyperlinks with computer vision. That's going to change retail, right? So we're already seeing signs of this in the world. We're seeing uh, websites like Howes. How many people know Howes? Right, so it's an interior decorating site. People can add tags manually so that you can say, I'm shopping for similar outdoor aluminum you know, sconces. But that requires manual tagging. What I'm talking about is a world where every single photo, the 1.8 billion that are uploaded today, become clickable in that same fine-grained way. Hopefully I'm blowing your mind. I mean, that sort of blows my mind, that idea that like, shit, all of this unstructured content that we trust, our friends' photos. So we did this quick little app. Um, these are my Instagram photos on the left and my friend's Instagram photos on the right. So you can be inspired. You can say, oh, I didn't know that Bijan also went to uh, Rome. Or is that Rome or Paris? I can't tell. Uh, and that sort of inspires you. This is what behavioral economists is called social proof. Your friends did it, so you're like, Shit, if my friends can do it, that's a tacit recommendation for something that's so much more persuasive than a brand photo. So then you can say, oh, nice shot of a place that we both love, Bijan. Um, maybe I should book a trip to go there, just like the things we talked about. So I, <laughs> I promise I'll need to show one spreadsheet, but I can't figure out a way to make this like less than a half a billion dollar business. If you look at the photos that are shared, if you look at how often things are reposted, I, I keep... I keep discounting my model, discounting my model, discounting my model. It still is like a huge opportunity to take someone's photos and link to other e-commerce opportunities because there's affiliate models. So conclusion, 
how did we get here again? How do we get to this world of shoppable photos from Internet of Things? Well, here are the steps. Phones leapt into cameras. Nope, cameras leapt into phones. <laughs> um, then social networks became photo sharing sites. Um, low cost data plans gave us, we don't worry at all about sharing as, as many photos as we want because AT&T and others are making it sort of free. Um, so we have massive user generated content out there. And then enter computer vision, which structures all of this unstructured content. Clouds make it affordable, thank you IBM, um, to, to read all these photos at scale. Uh, you have massive servers, uh, you know, we're running like 400 servers in parallel right now to label all these photos. And then all the photos that were taken volitionally, think about all the more photos that will be taken just by you know, wearable cameras and postable cameras. So that gives us this sort of vicarious experiences through, through our friends or, or influencers. And then you realize the business model for this is already plumbed, right? There are affiliate models for nearly every site that I showed up there. If you direct your friends to OpenTable, you get your God-given 5% of that transaction, right? And same for SeatGeek, and same for Turo, and same for Amazon. Thank you, Amazon. So, um, so all of the, the bits are in place to completely disrupt how we shop. So the prediction is every social stream becomes actionable. Um, I'm working on a company that is building classifiers to basically find your products in social media photos um, and then label all those photos and make them link linkable. So with that, I'd love to take some questions and um, thanks for allowing me to kick off this morning. Thanks. Thank you, David. You're welcome. That what, do you, what do you think? Outlook. Do you believe it? <laughs> so, the first question. Hey, my name is Rakesh I'm from FedEx. David, quick question. What applications do you see for computer vision in the logistics and transportation industry, if any? Mm. The companies that are powering the platforms that are enabling transportation networks to, to be more autonomous is, compu is computer vision. Um, I think, uh, you know, we, we, we talked to um, a group that, that Amazon acquired uh, last year in, down in Palo Alto. And we said, what do you think of this notion of shopping through other people's Instagram photos or Twitter photos or Tumblr photos? And they said, we have this group doing computer vision, but it's only in the logistics and operations side right now. Because when people return a product to Amazon, we don't want to have to have a human that looks at the product and says, oh, that's a Schick razor or, you know, or that's a teddy bear or whatever the product is. So they're, they're, they're putting products under a camera and automatically classifying what the product is, even if there's no RFID or label or, or any other tag, if you will. So, there, so I think being able to see products, classify products. I talked to somebody else at an Amazon conference a month ago, and they're using uh, computer vision with full spectrum cameras to look at, um, to predict how soon uh, fruit and vegetables will, um, will remain uh, edible. So for Amazon Fresh, they're figuring out, oh, this banana has like one more week to go. We better get it to a family that's nearby <laughs> <laughs> and not ship it too far. So they're using it for you know, predicting the, the rate of ripeness for, for fruits and vegetables. Um, I'm sure it's, you know, there are probably many, many um, other examples that I don't know of since that's not my field of study. When is the, the planning of releasing these products? And do you have any plans for the other markets other than USA to, to penetrate, like in the Middle East market? The second is uh, about security and privacy. Mm. Don't you think sometimes this is the deep insights are harming a little bit the privacy of the customers? Yeah, so the first question is about international. I mean, one of the nice things about photos is once you've trained the Sapporo beer classifier, it works across any photo posted anywhere in the world. So one of our partners is Oracle, and they have, they have customers everywhere. And uh, they like the fact that this is sort of language independent, if you will. You know, you can, if you have an expression classifier or an age classifier or a um, brand classifier, you know, the ability to see all of those things, that sort of works in photos and videos no matter where you are in the world. So it's sort of a, a nice international language that solves the language complexity that a lot of the text guys uh, have to deal with. 
So that's for international. In terms of privacy, um, I do think it's it's interesting that the we're not doing anything that's we're doing we're illegally looking at pe people's photos, right? So we are either looking at public photos that are totally public, or we are, for the app that I showed you, people are opting in and saying, yes, with my blessing, you can look at my photos, my friend's photos, just like I have that ability, um, and you can give me insights and pairings uh, between those things. I, I do think it brings up another, sort of a thorny issue about if people, uh, even though the photos are public, if people aren't aware of the technology, what, um, uh, what responsibility do we have to teach people that the technology is available? You know, if we can predict that just because she has five friends that have Harley Davidsons, that she's, that our, our network analysis says that she is very likely to be susceptible to Harley Davidson messages, um, should she know about predictive analytics in order to, to know why she's being targeted, or is that just something we should do? Um, I don't know. I hope that other, I hope that other people th this morning sort of take up the privacy problem, because uh, many of the use cases that people are putting uh, to use this, um, uh, the computer vision today is more of a sentinel one. It's more of a, we're just going to listen and learn how people are using products. And there haven't been as many brands that are directly engaging based on, um, you know, your shattered phone screen is, is, is shown, shows up in your social media feed. Samsung says, oh, shattered phone, he's susceptible in this moment right now to a message about a new Samsung Galaxy. Um, there's, that's, I'm starting to see more and more of that, but certainly the technology is more being used for listening today. Thanks. Fantastic keynote. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Round of applause.